Hi, I'm John Knight Lundwall, team leader of the Utah Cultural Astronomy Project. I've been asked to give a presentation for the International Dark Skies Association Week here in the state of Utah. I am very proud of the State Parks Department in Utah. I know several people in that workforce who have worked very hard to register sites as dark sky status within the state. And there are 23 registered sites more than anywhere else in the world. And if you spend uh, any amount of time under the night skies in Utah, you soon learn it is one of the best places to view the night sky. I've spent thousands of hours looking at the stars in this state, and almost always it's just magnificent. Well, just a brief introduction. I uh, hold a doctorate in comparative myth and religious studies. I have a research partner, John McHugh. He is a registered archaeologist with the state of Utah. I am a founding board member of the Utah Valley Astronomy Club. Um, and it turns out in 2017, Fremont Indian State Park in South Central Utah contacted our club and asked if someone could come down and help run some star parties because they were in the middle of uh, applying and registering for dark sky status with IDA. I volunteered to go down. This is uh, May of 2017, so it's not that long ago. Spent three nights there uh, running star parties. And during the days, I hiked the trails and looked at petroglyphs and a couple cave shelters. There's over 3,600 petroglyph images within the canyon where the park is located. And as it turns out, <clears throat> while I was uh, walking through the park, well, I was walking through the trails and I came across this petroglyph. I had spent, you know, a couple days looking at hundreds of images, lots of animals, humanoid figures, plants. Uh, but this was unique. It was a geometric shape. It's about five feet wide, three feet tall, uh, filled with different individual motifs. Uh, it has this really interesting wheel right here divided into 12 wedges, and there's some lines carved into here. And I guess I had astronomy on my mind, being that I was running star parties down there. And, you know, I, I didn't know anything about Fremont petroglyphs, uh, but I walked up and I counted 12 wedges, and 11 lines carved in here, 12, 13 lines total in the three wedges. And of course, you know, 13 is a lunar number, 12 is a solar number, and it just so happens that 11 is the difference in days between a synodic lunar year and one solar year. And so I just walked up and counted that and thought, hmm, are they, you know, is this a calendar glyph? And I stepped back, uh, to see if there's anything else. And that's when I noticed this triangular shadow moving across the petroglyph. And I didn't know it at the time, but had I been there a half hour earlier, I wouldn't have seen it. Had I been there an hour later, I wouldn't have seen it. So I just walked up right at the right moment to witness what was going on here. And of course, I completely got it wrong. But uh, within five minutes, I was like, oh, I'm 90% sure this is a calendar glyph, and they're using sun shadow somehow as part of its design. And this really piqued my interest. But, you know, the practical side of me took over, and I said, well, you know, to figure that out, and that would take probably years of research, for at least a year of research. And, of course, I underestimated that. Uh, so I just moved on. Well, I returned home and went to the Brigham Young University Library. BYU was uh, where the archaeologists who excavated the canyon in the 1980s, that's where they came from. And so they had field reports and papers, books, journals. And, uh, I, you know, I just perused through them to see if I could learn if anyone had done any work on that petroglyph panel. And it, it, it turned out no one had. So I decided to call John McHugh, my friend, an archaeologist, and we started the UCAP team. So let me just introduce the Fremont Indians uh, to you. They're a Native, Native American uh, indigenous population to the state, of, well, to what is now the state of Utah. Uh, they lived within this region 
between about 300 to 1300 CE. Uh, this date it can be pushed back earlier than that. Uh, the Fremont are not a, you know, a homogenous people. They were separate individual, semi-nomadic probably, uh, tribes. We don't even know if they spoke all the same language. We identify the Fremont by four identifying markers, which are here. They had a plain grayware pottery. Uh, they lived in pit houses, which were, you know, square holes dug in the ground, three or four feet deep, which they would put posts and then beams and, and a wood roof. Uh, this exterior was covered in clay mud, and you accessed the pit house, which is what it's called, through a hole in the top and a ladder. Uh, they wore moccasins, these uh, culture groups in the southwest here. They they wore sandals, so uh, th their moccasins uh, are different for the Fremont uh, cultural complex. And the Fremont did have a unique style of rock art that is different from these other groups. Uh, their humanoid figures called anthropomorphs have trapezoidal bodies with wide shoulders and narrow waists. So these uh, identifying factors identify the people that are loosely put together as Fremont. Here we are. Uh, this is Clear Creek Canyon, South Central Utah. Um, there's a hill down here, which we're going to look at shortly, where in the 1980s they were building Interstate 70 and that hill was scheduled to be bulldozed out of existence. They were going to use the dirt of the hill for road base of Interstate 70. And that just so happened to be the location of a large Fremont village. And they discovered that as they began bulldozing the hill. Um, so archaeologists uh, excavated the site. And sadly, uh, most of the hill did get bulldozed uh, and is now underneath Interstate 70. And in the 1980s, the archaeological <laughs> rules for preservation of sites were not as strict as they were today. But uh, as a result of all of that, Fremont Indian State Park and Museum was created um, to preserve everything that was there and is now really, a, it's a heritage site, one of the premier state parks in the state. Well, here's uh, Clear Creek Canyon. It runs roughly east-west um, and there are different uh, markers that uh, different uh, places that we have been studying for the past three years. This is Five Finger Ridge, which is where that village was. And it turns out to be the largest Fremont village ever excavated. That doesn't mean it is the largest village. It, there's, plenty, there's plenty that have not been discovered, uh, but it certainly... Um, had about 100 structures on that hill, uh, probably a population of around 70 people, which is you know about as big as these villages ever got. But what we don't know is how many people came in and out. Uh, you know, a lot of these cultures are have semi-nomadic travelings, people coming in and out through the year, and we just have no idea what the dynamics of the population demographic were during this process. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about a bluff at the western end of Clear Creek Canyon located here called the Sunwheel Panel. It's uh, one of the premier petroglyphs in North America. Um, there are a couple caves in Clear Creek Canyon, clear, uh, cave shelters. We'll just briefly review those. Cave of 100 Hands and Sheep Shelter Cave. Both of them are very interesting and um, unique. Uh, there is a, another major calendar panel that we have been working on for the past year and a half called the Sheep Spiral Panel, about a quarter, a third of a mile away from the Sunwheel Panel. Um, we won't be talking about that tonight, but it is uh, it's quite spectacular. Uh, and then there is a Walking Man panel. Let's just, uh, here is the Cave of a Hundred Hands, uh, and, and you see the pictographs back here. A pictograph is a painted image, and a petroglyph is a carved image, a pecked image in the stone. Well, this cave has pictographs, no petroglyphs. 
Uh, and it just so happens that um, you know, just by coincidence, we began noticing in other areas in the state of Utah, other cave shelters containing pictographs of hands, no petroglyphs. And so we've identified four separate cave shelters now that have this feature. And of course, they're widely dispersed, which means that there, there's some sort of methodology going on with the ancient Fremont. And they'd find a special cave shelter that would only put handprints, pictographs in it. Um, and this, you know, seems to be across the tribes, across the landscape. So uh, we have yet to determine why that is. I just bring it up because the outlier is this cave shelter, which has some of the most unique, for uh, you know, rock art that I've ever seen. Uh, these actually began as pictographs. But technically, they're not petroglyphs. I, you know, I don't know what people would call them, but these formations are caused by thousands of imprints of people pressing their hands against the sandstone. Uh, and there are hundreds of handprints. Some of the handprints do show pictograph pigments in them. So it's probable that, you know, some of these started as pictographs, but as people came and pilgrimage to the site, they would press their hand against it. And over time, they would form these images. This is in Kodachrome State Park, about 30 minutes southeast of uh, Bryce National Monument. The other cave shelter in the canyon is uh, called Sheep Shelter Cave. And this really kind of anchored my study in the canyon, that and the Sunwheel Petroglyph. It's this small cave shelter that's, you know, five, six feet deep, six feet tall, about 30 feet wide. Um, here, the archaeologists, when they surveyed the camera, they, uh, canyon, they actually dug several deep feet down in the cave floor to see what they could find. And what they did find was several layers of campfire ash. And the earliest layer dated back to about 3500 BCE. And the latest layer dated to about 500 CE. Uh, so for, you know, 4,000 years, people have been migrating through this canyon using this little cave shelter as a, you know, as a cave shelter, building little campfires and, and, and uh, you know, camping within it. Well, the last layer of uh, campfire ash is about 500 CE, which is about the time the Fremont occupied the canyon. So for whatever reason, the Fremont came in, they stopped building campfires in this cave shelter, and they carved petroglyphs in it, and which means they're using it for a different purpose than as a cave shelter. Well, uh, the park let me um, camp in the cave shelter overnight. Um, and it turns out only at night do you realize one of the spectacular features of this cave shelter. And that is, you know, here is Scorpio right here. That's Jupiter. The ecliptic follows the cave ceiling. Just it's a natural uh, coincidence of nature that by sitting in this cave, you can watch the stars and the planets along the ecliptic rise and move across the cave ceiling set on, on the right side. Now, in the winter months, the ecliptic actually is up uh, above the cave as you're sitting in it. But a thousand years ago, the cave floor was about six feet lower. It's been filled in with a thousand years of erosion, dust, dirt, which means you would have seen the ecliptic year round. Um, and when I realized that, I realized this was a perfect place to view uh, the stars. And we know that they did. They, they kept solar, lunar and stellar calendars. And uh, so this uh, turns out to be a very special place. It's also, by the way, a winter solstice sunrise viewing point. Only a couple weeks before winter solstice and a couple weeks after winter solstice, you can actually see the sun rise right here, um, you know, for a few weeks, 
which means only for a few weeks of the year does sunlight penetrate the cave shelter. And so when you first see the sunrise on this horizon, uh, you, you know you've only got a couple weeks to the winter solstice. So it would be a winter solstice viewing shrine as well. Well, here we are on this hill, Five Finger Ridge. And uh, this is where the village was built. It is south of the highway, south of the bluff. And uh, this is a picture of a pit house looking up, um, a shot I took. And uh, so this is kind of how they would live and uh, how you would, there was oh, well, probably, I can't remember now, 60, 70 pit houses on this hill. This hill is only about a third of the size of what it originally was. So it used to be much larger. This is a night shot that was lit up uh, for me as I was taking the shot with a FedEx truck. Uh, so that was, a, that was a lucky shot. But just to show you the night sky of Fremont Indian State Park, just for the next few slides, here I am standing on top of Five Finger Ridge on uh, the spring equinox. It's about 4 a.m. And uh, this is a picture of the Milky Way. I mean, you can see the Milky Way with the naked eye uh, if it's a clear night uh, through the year. It's spectacular dark skies. This is a single 20 second exposure image using a Canon Rebel T6i full spectrum master modified camera. Here's the court of ceremonies. Uh, this rock bluff is covered in petroglyphs. There's wisps of clouds in the sky. This is a 13 second single shot image. There's the Big Dipper. And um, you can see that the stars just <laughs> fill the sky. There's Walking Man Rock, petroglyphs on this side of the rock. There's actually a couple here pointing north. That's very interesting. I'll talk about it briefly. A band of the Milky Way uh, above it. There's Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, the skies, you know, I've spent scores of nights uh, in this canyon uh, from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, looking at the stars. You know, every night I do that, uh, I see tons of shooting stars, some of them so bright and spectacular. I've seen the International Space Station many times fly overhead. Uh, so it really is a, a quite spectacular sky. Finally, here's a winter shot of uh, a pit house. I'm actually laying on my stomach to take this picture. My camera's six inches off the ground. But look at those stars. There's so many that it, um, well, it's just magnificent. Well, let's get back to uh, our presentation. Here we are on top of Five Finger Ridge, on top of that hill. I'm facing east. And we are looking at the eastern horizon. And I have marked here the sunrise positions on that local horizon through the year. And as I'm sure most of you know, the sun does not rise in the same position every day. Uh, it, it moves north and south through the year. It reaches its furthest north position at summer solstice, where it rises here. It then starts drifting southwards, reaching its equinox position here. And finally, winter solstice position here where it stops and then starts drifting northwards. Halfway between equinox and solstice is a cross-quarter day where the sun rises. You can see that that uh, sun is not equidistant between these two points because the sun moves quicker during the middle of the year than towards the solstice days where it slows way down. Well, here's the canyon. Uh, the sun, not only does the sun move north during, uh, you know, at summer solstice, but it's also higher in the sky. Its declination is higher. At winter solstice, its declination is lower. It's lower in the sky. And what this means, by the way, is that the sun shadow lines that the sun casts on the rock faces slowly change through the year. And it turns out the Fremont people watched that and they incorporated the changing sun shadow lines in some of their petroglyphs. One of the first things we noticed was that all the petroglyphs, all of them, 
were carved on one side of the canyon, the north side of the canyon. Uh, so all these rock bluffs here contain no petroglyphs that we have been able to find. There is that Cave of a Hundred Hand cave shelter here on this side of the canyon, but it doesn't have petroglyphs. It has pictographs. And in any case, special geologic features are exceptions to the rule we have discovered. And the rule is, in this canyon, 99% of the petroglyphs face between southeast and southwest. A few score face due east, due west, and only a few face northwards. Uh, so there is a methodological astuteness of facing your petroglyphs in one direction. And of course, we have now traveled to many places across the state of Utah, and this methodology holds up. The, the vast majority of Fremont petroglyphs face between southeast, south, southwest. I mean, you, you do find east and west and, and northwest and northeast. A lot of them are oriented towards where the sun rises and sets. Um, and this, uh, you know, makes us realize that the petroglyphs are, are oriented towards the sun. They're a form of sun writing. And we believe, you know, through analogical thinking of these ancient oral peoples, that uh, when the petroglyphs were touched by sunlight, they were activated. Uh, we'll discuss that a little bit more. Well, here at the West End, of the canyon is this rock bluff. And it's very interesting because here along these rocks are some of the oldest petroglyphs in the canyon. Um, we know that they're some of the oldest because they're very faded. Some of them almost invisible. You, you just The sunlight has to hit it just right for you to be able to see them. So it's a very old layer of petroglyphs, probably some of the earliest ones carved, which means when the Fremont occupied the canyon, you know, they started carving their rock art. There's some petroglyphs on this rock bluff, but the main one we're going to be looking at is right here. It's that big sunwheel panel. There is this panel, this big geometric shape. There's some petroglyphs over to the top left of it. Here's my time-lapse cameras. So let's talk about this petroglyph. Um, the first thing we see is that it has a wheel of 12 wedges. And of course, most of the, all these southwestern tribes were agrarian. They grew corn, beans, and squash. And if you're an agrarian tribe, you keep a solar calendar because your crops are based off the solar year. And in fact, your year is divided, well, it's divided into lunar months, but every month is generally associated with a phase of agriculture. When you germinate a seed, when you plant a seed, when, you know, it's, it's first phase of growth, it's maturation phase of growth, when you harvest it, and they peak. What they plant waves of crops, right? So they do a planting in May and they do a planting in June. They might even, um, you know, that they have to harvest before the frost comes. And so over centuries of doing this, they've got it down to a science. So, so these 12 wedges, when I look at it, that certainly reminds me of a solar year. Well, these 12 wedges have these cupules carved in them. Uh, so they're, they're de de round depressions pecked into the rock. Someone has come and pecked a rock in. The center one is quite deep and large. And uh, there is a Native American word called Sipepu. It's Southwestern tribes. And that is a connecting point between this world and the next world, Sipepu. And in kivas that we find in the Southwest, they will carve a hole in the kiva uh, and that hole represents the connecting point between this world and the heavenly world and when we first uh, looked at that deep depression you know McHugh's comment was uh, that looks like a sipepu to me this is where they're anchoring this petroglyph image to the powers of the other side the eternal world well there's these other uh, cupules that I was paying attention to 
of course, you know, a year into it, I realized, well, look, there's cupules all over this thing. And, you know, I'll, I'll highlight those here shortly. But then there's this hole up here. And that is not a cupule. In fact, when I uh, first started studying the panel, I just thought that was a natural hole. A rock pebble fell out of the rock face and just left a hole. And I didn't pay much attention to it until I realized that it was an integral part of the petroglyph design. And then I studied it and realized that there were actually striations in the hole. It had been drilled with a stick or a bone. And so that was a drilled hole. These are pecked holes. Well, there are 13 lines carved in three wedges. 13, of course, is a lunar number. Their primary calendar would have been a lunar calendar. And, uh, you know, when I first actually came to this panel, I thought, well, what's going to happen on this rock face? And, you know, how will it happen like just within a few days of the solstice? And it took me a while to realize they, the ancient Fremont needed a lot of lead time uh, for their significant ritual days, which would be the solstices and equinoxes. Well, actually, they had significant ritual days every month of the year. Uh, so not just on the solstices and equinoxes, but very often those rituals had to correspond with a certain phase of the moon. And those change through the year, through the years. And so um, your lighting effects on these petroglyphs won't be generally precisely to the day. Like this feature happens on the day of summer solstice. Generally, it's uh, two, three, four weeks before summer solstice where the sunlight phenomenon starts happening on the petroglyph. Because when it starts happening on the petroglyph, the people then say, oh, this is starting on the next full moon. We will perform our ritual. So they have to integrate their lunar and solar cycles with their agricultural cycle. So uh, they give themselves some lead time. Also, you know, half the days are cloudy. So <laughs> every other day, these <laughs> solar uh, sun lighting effects are obscured. There are these seven wavy lines on this petroglyph, which is a repeated image in the petroglyphs in this canyon and in other places. There is a quadrated field right next to what we interpret as an upside down corn tassel. And then there are a row of 37, 36, 37. I mean, a couple of those dots are badly eroded, so we can't tell if they're one or two. Uh, but our best guess is 37 counting dots upon which are two stick figures. They're men with erect phalluses. And this immediately tells us we're looking at a fertility scene. And of course, the entire petroglyph is a phallus. So we're looking at a fertility scene. And with these uh, ancient peoples, you know, it's analogical metaphorical thinking. So whatever's happening on this petroglyph they are going to try to take the power of that petroglyph and imbue it within their fields and in their tribe through sympathetic means. Well, here are all the cupules on this petro. Well, not quite all of the cupules, but there's a couple actually right up here. But the ones that they're employing with the sunlight, and that's what makes this petroglyph panel so unusual. They have carved these cupules in the petroglyph rock face as a way to catch the sunlight through the year. So let me show you how they did it. There's actually two other spots. This lower left spot has, these are actually naturally eroded holes, but the Fremont have pecked around them. They have enhanced them which means that they're incorporating that natural feature into the petroglyph. And the same thing here, there's a natural crack, but they have pecked around these cracks and holes, enhancing it so that they're incorporating these natural features into the petroglyph design. And it turns out this spot here is almost always the first spot illuminated by the sunlight through the year. And so this is where they're anchoring the sun. They're literally catching the sun and empowering this petroglyph with it. Uh, labeled S for summer, but it's you know through well, probably seven, eight months of the year where the sunlight starts on, on that spot. 
Well, here we are looking east again, and I'm going to show you how the sunlight works on the Sunwell petroglyph starting here at summer solstice. This is, you know, the culmination of their solar year um, where their crops are all planted and they do their rituals to make sure they have a great harvest. Um, and there's all kinds of sympathetic metaphorical relations with their religion, with the fertility and the tribe and the crops. And so it becomes a very important part of their, I mean, a critical part of their year. Um, as the sun stands still at the summer solstice position, it starts drifting southwards until, you know, 45 days later, it's at its cross quarter point, August 5th. Um, and then the sunlight phenomenon on the sunwheel petroglyph has changed and they have marked the change. And then as the sun drifts to the equinox position, they've marked that change. The cross quarter in the winter, cross, fall cross quarter, they've marked that change. And then the winter solstice, they've marked the change. So we're going to start here on the panel showing you how it works at summer solstice. And then I'm going to show you how the light shadow shifts across the rock face through the year. So here we are at the sun wheel panel at summer solstice. At summer solstice, there is a triangle of light that comes up from the ground and it first touches this right lower cupule C. There's a bulge in the rock that casts a shadow over the entire rock face and as the sun moves over the rock, it, uh, that, that shadow slowly recedes, and so the light comes up from the bottom. So, and then there's this triangle of light that touches here, this cupule, it comes up and touches the center cupule, and it ends at this top hole. So let me show you this in time-lapse video. Here's a 90-second video. Here's a wide shot of it, and you can see how the sun shadow line moves across the rock face. There's the petroglyph. Here it comes, and there's that triangle of light that goes up right through the center of the sun wheel. Here's a close-up of that, and again, it's this spot that gets touched first, but here we go. Here it is right there, and it's going to come up and touch this uh, lower right cupule. Um, it's really quite something to watch just that triangle of light. It's like a golden stalk of corn growing up from the ground, uh, intersects that cupule. It's going to come up, fill this wedge full with the 11 lines, and then touch that center deep cupule. And then it's going to end with that drilled hole up at the top right. Now, another interesting feature of this sun shadow phenomenon is that is happening. There it goes. Once it hits this center cupule, it actually ascends up to this top hole rather quickly. And there it is. There's that wedge of light that happens. So that happens on the summer solstice. It starts... So that triangle of light actually shifts all the way around this petroglyph, and we're going to look at that. All right, at the cross quarter date, halfway between summer solstice and fall equinox, that dagger of light has shifted to the left, and it first comes up from the ground and touches the lower left cupule. And then it comes up, touches the center hole, and ends at that drilled hole at the top. Then... At the fall equinox, this triangle of light, dagger of light, shifts over to the light, uh, left again. And in fact, this whole picture that is taken was taken on the fall equinox. And you can see that triangle of light. It comes up, first touches those, touches that very faint cupule there, and ends at this hole. So here is that image where the fall equinox, the sun dagger moves across this way. And I have a video, time-lapse video of that. Okay. 
Here we go. The sunlight's going to first touch this area down here, and then it's going to stream across that rock face. There it goes. There it is. And here's that triangle forming. There it is. Comes right up. So they've carved a series of cupules there for the equinox, here for the cross quarter day, here for the summer solstice, as they catch the tip of that sun dagger through the year. Well, here is the cross quarter day halfway between fall equinox and winter solstice, and that long triangle of light actually gets truncated to a short triangle of light as it streams down these three cupules. And then after that, it just sort of blends into a vertical line, which washes across the entire panel. And then at winter solstice, the phenomenon is really quite something. It highlights this crack up here. And then there is a bulge of light that follows this to this left figure. And that left figure gets swallowed in light. But it happens instantaneously. Uh, there's the winter solstice sunlight effect. Here is the video of it. There it is. At sunrise, uh, the light feature, there's that bulge of light, the dagger of light that moves across, and then it fades into a straight line. Uh, it's fading out because clouds are going over top the sun as I'm filming it. And then it perfectly frames, that shadow line perfectly frames that left a standing figure and as the shadow recedes that right standing figure is actually in shadow most of the time that makes us think that this left standing figure represents the winter solstice and this guy represents the summer solstice So they've used these cupules to catch the tip of that sun dagger through the year. So they're capturing the power of the sun in different seasons. Now we asked, why would they drill this hole up here, that top right hole, and all of these ones are pecked cupules? Why the difference? And then I you know, theorized, what if they put a stick in that hole, a stick or a bone? That would cast a shadow that would move across the rock face through the year. And maybe they were also using that shadow as a calendar implement. That was our first theory. Of course, the length of the stick would uh, determine the length of the shadow. Uh, we theorized the length of the stick would probably be recorded on the petroglyph itself. So we measured you know, different relationships and we settled on the length of the uh, cupule down here to the cupule in the center which turns out to be exactly 12 inches. So it was easy to get a, a foot-long dowel, uh, which we used. Of course, this is all speculative. But what we noticed is that we put the stick there and we started looking at the shadow it cast. But it didn't take long before you know, we realized that actually you put a stick in there and the first thing that lights up on the rock face before the rock face actually gets lit up, uh, lit up is the tip of the stick because it's sticking out of the rock face. So the tip of the stick gets lit up by the sunlight first, and that made us realize perhaps they weren't using it as a gnomon shadow stick, but rather as a way to bless prayer feathers. They would uh, stick a stick and put beads and feathers on the stick, and as the sun rose, these would be the first things that would catch the sunlight in the different seasons. And then they would take those beads or feathers and put them on their ritual costumes, their ritual staves, their ritual drums, their ritual flutes. And suddenly those things would be imbued by the power of the sun. So this is in the ethnography of using uh, prayer tokens in this way to sympathetically capture the power of, of the cosmos. And so, our, uh, I mean, here's another drilled hole that, that so there's actually several drilled holes on this rock on over here all that rock face is spalled off so there probably was petroglyphs there at some point but it's all gone but the the drilled holes remain 
and it makes us realize that there probably was this rock face was covered in feathers and beads during their ritual cycle um, as they would probably stick little sticks or bones in there and, and then bl bless their prayer implements. Well, ultimately, um, there's one more feature of this petroglyph that I thought, uh, again, this is the, the sun shadow phenomenon that happens across it and we, we've recorded. So we know that they're using these cupules to catch the tip of that sun dagger through the year. Um, but there is this petroglyph here that I, I thought was very interesting. Only in our interpretation of it, and we try not to interpret petroglyphs because there's no writing in this culture. And so it, it becomes a very subjective game. But what I can say is, here's a close up of that petroglyph. There's a horizontal line that's framed by four squares. There's one right here. It's kind of a D shape, but there's a square up top with a curved line coming out of it. There's a square that bisects this horizontal line to the left. And then this one here is almost invisible, but there's a lower square underneath. Now, I, you know, normally I, there's a couple dots that are lightly packed here, too. And normally, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do with that. It was a unique image. I haven't seen anything quite like that elsewhere, not only in Clear Creek Canyon, but elsewhere. There are all kinds of interesting geometric shapes and forms through the petroglyphs, and I, I just chalked it up to that. But we studied this panel not only during the solar year, but we would come to it at night. Here's the Sunwell petroglyph. I've lit it up using LED lights, starry sky. And, you know, we just wanted to see what stars rose on the local horizon, what you could see, because we know they're using a stellar calendar. Now, being that this rock face is facing south, we're facing north. So if, you know, so w which direction are they looking? Are they looking north or are they looking south? to determine star risings. Well, the South is wide open. Um, in any case, what we discovered quickly, uh, this is uh, an hour and a half after sunset on spring equinox. And you can see the Big Dipper right here rises vertically over the rock bluff. There's the Sunwell petroglyph. It rises almost straight up and down as the sunlight fades away at the spring equinox at night. Uh, it's really something to behold. And here we have uh, a close-up of it. And it turns out you can't see the tail of the Big Dipper. It's behind the rock face. This star here and this star here are the bottom two stars of the bowl of the Big Dipper. So the square of the Big Dipper sits right on top of the rock bluff as you stand in front of the panel at the evening of spring equinox. Well, it turns out here is the Big Dipper at the, you know, an hour after sunset on summer solstice. It's high up in the sky. Here is the Big Dipper an hour after sunset at the fall equinox, the sunwell panel is to the right. It's off image. Uh, and as you stand in front of that panel, actually, these bottom two stars are submerged, uh, you know, beneath this bluff. So there is that. And then here is the Big Dipper at the winter solstice. And you can't see it because it's behind the bluff. And, sh and so... It just so happens that uh, I was with John McHugh and I was explaining to him that you could actually use the Big Dipper through the year. If you look at it at the same time of night through the year, it changes position and you can use it as a calendar. So when it's in this position, you know, it's this month uh, and you know what solar sun shadow phenomenon is going to be happening on that rock face. And sure enough, during the day, that's exactly what happens on that rock face. And as that transforms across the rock face, the Big Dipper transforms across the sky. And I was explaining where all the stars of the Big Dipper would be through the year when I looked down and realized, well, actually, what I'm explaining is all depicted right here in this upper left glyph. Here are the squares of the Big Dipper. 
And it just so happens that this one in the fall is half submerged underneath the rock bluff. This one that's almost invisible is invisible during the winter. This one that sits right on the line is what sits right on the bluff. And this one up high is the summer solstice. So I looked down and I said, well, John, everything I'm describing is pictorially displayed right here in this glyph. So, you know, our, 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 our subjective uh, interpretation of that glyph is it represents uh, the bowl of the Big Dipper through the year that correlates with the sun shadow phenomenon that moves across the rock face through the year. So they're integrating uh, the sun and the stars in that petroglyph. So, look, there, that is a spectacular petroglyph because it uses sunlight through the entire year. And as it you know, ends with the winter solstice, the sun turns back north and all those sun lighting effects reverse back down to the summer solstice position, which then reverses back to the winter solstice and back and forth like a metronome, that sun dagger moves back and forth across that petroglyph. It's a very sophisticated, elegant, and yet simple way to catch the sun and to keep a calendar. Of course, the calendric aspects of that calendar are probably secondary. It's a fertility glyph. And the primary purpose of that petroglyph is to capture the power of the sun within the tribe, within their rituals, within their agricultural cycle, within their religious lives. And so that's the primary purpose. The calendric aspect is secondary, though present. Um, in any case, uh, this is what the Utah Cultural Astronomy Project uh, is researching. We have actually found several calendar glyphs. None, well, uh, some are quite spectacular. And this one here in Fremont Indian State Park is uh, certainly a premier panel. Uh, we don't know of anything like it in North America. Uh, so look, if you have a free moment, visit Fremont Indian State Park. It's point of interest number two. You can uh, look at it yourself. Uh, just to end this presentation, I would like to remind everyone, please never touch or deface rock art on a rock art panel. The amount of vandalism on the petroglyphs is so enormous. It's really breathtaking. And in fact, uh, the Sunwell panel itself has been vandalized since we've been um, investigating it and that really inhibits our ability to work. So please do not touch, please do not scratch your initials or, or, or do anything. Look at the petroglyphs, enjoy the petroglyphs. Uh, please know that many of the petroglyphs, you know, they're not doodles and, you know, they're not just initials, you know, Larry loves Sally. They're sacred rock art, a form of sacred sun writing. Some of them are astronomically aligned to the sun shadow lines through the year. Of course, the light of the full moon would cast uh, shadows across the rock faces as well. So they're probably lunar petroglyphs that we just don't know about that the Fremont were tracking. Uh, so they're capturing the power of the cosmos in these images. And when that happens, these images come to life. They had a belief that these images were living, breathing images of the divine. And that's how we should treat them uh, at least to respect that tradition. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the International Dark Skies Association Week. Uh, get out to Utah State Parks, National Parks. Enjoy the night sky. It's one of the most magnificent, wonderful things to see a truly dark sky. Um, and I will end this presentation there. You can look up some of our work on my YouTube channel, just type my name into YouTube and uh, under my personal channel, you'll find some of our uh, FISP films. I've got a new one coming out, hopefully in the next couple weeks, which will go over everything, uh, go over the petroglyphs of Fremont Indian State Park. Um, so here are some of the videos that you might find interesting, one on that Sunwheel petroglyph uh, one on a pictograph in northeastern Utah that is quite spectacular. And one on uh, an artifact, an amulet or necklace that was found that is actually a lunar calendar. Um, 
Anyway, thanks for your time, and we'll open up to questions and answers.